12 Stone, this is a friend of mine, Hassani Pettiford. And Hassani, you've been a 12 Stoner for two, three years now. And uh, you've been putting your career energy into Couples Academy, which is really helping uh, marriages that have gone through a fair, how to recover mm -hmm. from that. Uh, you've been coaching people in divorce prevention, uh, counseling people and marriage conflict kinds of things. And uh, I've read your book, The Audacity of Marriage, by you and Danielle. And now, how long have you and Danielle been married? We've been married for 15 wonderful 15. years. And you had to call them wonderful <laughs> years, right? <laughs> Would she say 15 wonderful years? Who knows? <laughs> we may get to that. And you have children? Four girls. Four girls. Yes, all sir. girls. All girls. And what are the ages? Paris is 13. Uh -huh. Madison is 12. Savannah is 7. And Sydney is... Uh, six. Six. Yeah, yeah, I, you, know, okay, you, you have four track. girls, dude. You can, you have all the free and and no boys. Do you at least have like a male dog? To I don't help have a you? dog, a cat, a fish. It's just me and five, five females in one home. To one. Yeah. See, God was gracious in my home and gave me three boys, and so <laughs> three boys, one girl. It's four to two, and that's barely even. But that's your world. So you have a a, a lot to bring to the table. I do to this conversation. So let's talk about uh, conflict in marriage. Mm -hmm. In your experience with so many uh, couples, uh, where do couples tend to get stuck in conflict and why? Well, first of all, it's important to understand what conflict is. Conflict is nothing more than two opposing wills operating in the same place at the same time. And so oftentimes it's hard to come up with a way to work through those conflicts because we have two completely different perceptions about how to handle things. And what happens is over the course of time, couples go from being soulmates to roommates to roommates because of this conflict. And some of the key areas where it really shows up the most is in the area of our communication. That's probably the number one issue that most couples have. And because they can't effectively communicate, it prevents them from resolving issues in their marriage. You try and help couples break through. And you sit with couples in some of their most intense breakdowns. An affair, I mean, that's a huge breach of trust. And you major in those conversations. What are some of the most helpful things you try to bring to couples uh, to, to coach them into restoration? I think one of the keys, first of all, you know, I focus on the marital recovery, the individual recovery process, and doing those things combined, couples are able to make a quantum leap forward in their success. But then you have the affair recovery process, which is a very detailed, specific process that you go through in order to properly heal. And so in the context of conflict, I think one of the biggest keys that we have to remember is that we're taught often that compromise is the key to a successful relationship. And though I understand the concept behind it, I have a problem with that. Because compromise, in essence, creates a win-lose scenario. So someone wins and someone loses. And that may work in terms of resolving short-term, immediate situations. But over the course of time, if someone's constantly compromising for the other person, it creates an imbalance in the relationship. And so you get to a point where you're just ready to go rogue. And so because we have all of these unresolved issues, it results in affairs. It results in divorce. And so I think a better concept would be something that we call marital negotiation. Because a negotiation is a win-win scenario based upon the policy of joint agreement where you both win and come out on top. But I've been through what I'll call negotiation efforts with Marsha over the years. Right. And in our earlier years, when it was more challenging to say the least, uh, it was hard to lead a negotiation when you're in the negotiation. True. Is is So do you find that many times couples can't really do that together? Do we always need outside help? Or can you figure out how to negotiate together and get well, to a win-win? I, I think, first of all, I think there has to be ground rules for effective communication. If there's no form of government in your home, if you don't have laws, if, in essence, that you abide by, then you have a lawless home. And lawlessness leads to anarchy. So you have to have a foundation to begin with. But I absolutely believe in bringing third parties in, whether that be uh, a marriage expert, a coach, um, a marriage mentor, another couple that you admire, and you say, you know what, they have something that we could probably glean from. 
you know, in our marriage to make our relationship better. So bringing an outside voice is important because you're emotionally connected to your spouse. So you're listening with emotional ears. But when you bring someone in who's emotionally detached, they bring in a level of wisdom and expertise and just a sound mind to help you balance out the issues that you're struggling with. Now, as you're talking, you you, you have this um, knit nicely. You're very clear, and I, it all makes sense when you say it. I'm imagining that that's how it's always been for you and Danielle. <laughs> you guys got married. You've become a marriage expert, mm-hmm. so this was, is all, always been easy, right? Well, I became a marriage <laughs> expert, if you will, learning how not to do all the wrong things. <laughs> the first few years that's how of most our... of us get good at anything, isn't yes, it? Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I would say, you know, year three into our marriage, we were on the verge of divorce. Uh, we were ready to throw in the towel and call it quits. And and either I was going to divorce her or she was going to divorce me. But it was in that moment that I made the decision to divorce me from myself, hmm. to divorce myself from my poor communication habits because I was a verbal assassin, to divorce myself from my false sense of masculinity uh, and manhood, which wasn't working in favor of my union to divorce myself from certain beliefs and concepts that I held on to. And once I divorced myself from those things, I was able to remain married to my wife. And so, yes, we had many struggles in the very beginning of our marriage and went through a similar process that I now take many couples through. Talk to me about some techniques. I, I know there are things that you you have to give to people that are practical. Like, if you, how do you win in communication? How do you navigate uh the conflict because you're in the tension of it. Yeah. Uh, so I've heard you talk about that stuff before. Help us with any techniques you try and bring to couples. Well, there's a few things. So number one, we need to understand that there are three components to effective communication. Number one, you have your words, what you say. That represents 7% of your communication. Then there's, there's your tonality, how you say what you say. That's 23%. And then your facial expressions and body language, 70%. And so oftentimes, these different components send across different messaging that becomes problematic. And so we're not hearing what our partner is saying because we're so caught up in how they said what they said, which gets us in trouble. So once you learn how to properly navigate through those three forms of communication, number one, that will work. Number two, I think it's important to realize that you have to make the Bible final authority in your marriage. And I think ultimately, when it comes to compatibility, we think that our partner has to think like us and be wired like us and perceive like us, and God did not make us that way. So we have to get back into the Word and find out what the governing principles that are outlined in the Scripture that we need to submit to in order to find some type of balance. And as long as that's the authority, we both win, as opposed to one of us losing and one of us winning. You know, a third thing is, I think we need to give up the need to have to be right. When you have to be right, by default, it makes your partner wrong. And if you're always trying to get in a position where you're trying to prove your partner to be wrong, and even if you are right, ultimately you lose in the end anyway, because now that person walks away defeated. They walk away feeling as if they have no voice, no opinion. And so, you know, I think it's important to realize that when you're discussing things, the discussion should be about what is right. When you're arguing, it's more about who is right. That's a distinction. And so by having these key things in place, I think you can really overcome a lot of the challenges that you experience to have a mutually beneficial, fulfilling relationship. Last thought. As I hear you talk through what it it takes to resolve conflict, you speak with a hopefulness. Do you really believe that conflict-filled marriages can return to restored love, deep companionship, uh, emotional intimacy. Do you, do you really buy this stuff? The reason why I believe it is because, number one, I'm an example of it. As I tell all of my clients, this is not just my profession, it's my passion. Because I've been in your seat. I know where you are. I know what you're going through. And if we could make it, then you could make it. We've been and dealt with couples who have been in some of the worst situations that you can even imagine. And through the power of love, through the power of forgiveness and proper reconciliation, you can bounce back from any hardship. And in essence, your relationship could be better after the crisis than it was prior to the crisis because the crisis makes you aware of what was wrong in the relationship in the first place. So as you begin to make course corrections, there is hope for your future.
That's a great word. Thanks, Asani. Thank you.